yeah good day guys i hope you're all doing well and everything is going on well uh, like i mentioned to you last week that uh, in this week i have a conference for which reason i would have to record my lecture and give to you that is why i've had to come your way through this channel um yes it's my as it were my page and so uh, and every week i upload a few like five at most 10 minutes video on some salient issues that work uh, with the youth and so you can subscribe and be a part of uh, my productions and uh, let's just boil on sure but um so as you well know last week when we came to class i mentioned that on this course we are doing an asynchronic uh, approach where I'll come to lectures and then sometimes if need be, uh, will come your way via this channel. So when you subscribe, you get notification of uploads and then you enjoy the class. But um, again, you know that as for the book, you will need to get, but it's not compulsory, not at all. <clears throat> It's not compose you <laughs> you just make a choice and then um, be a part of it and uh, we'll take a sakai uh, assignment and other stuff seriously uh last week we did about uh, how to the approaches to the study of religions and today we are going to talk about uh, another very important aspect and we're beginning the entire discussion last week was more of an introduction and the conceptualization but today we're getting into the discussions and i need you to follow and uh, take up the necessary things that you need to and then be a part of it so um if we begin ultimately what we're, we're going to be talking about today is uh, captured as the so uh, we're basically talking about the social and political world of jesus the social and political world of jesus so uh, as you well know um the Christian movement was begun by Jesus. And so we need to understand what environment he came from, what the institutions and structures were that have contributed to uh, the Christian good. Because you see, the one point we made last week was to the effect that the environment in which a religion emerges affects the nature and the expressions of the religion. So that I made mention of the fact that if you were a Muslim, uh, uh, I mean, there is nothing wrong with, I mean, seeing the Imam in a Jarabia. But if you are a Christian and uh, you go to the mocks and you see, uh, if you are a Christian, sorry, you go to the church and you see your pastor in a Jarabia, you'll be questioning yourself in a lot of ways. But here it's not the same. And so uh, that is just about it. So we are looking at the social and uh, what do you call um political world of jesus when he came so in doing this my outline is to introduce the whole thing and then we'll talk about the jewish religious and political structures where we will give attention to the sahindrin the uh, synagogue the temple the pharisees the sadducees and then the zealot. These are very important structures that the Jews had and uh, they need to be looked at in order to understand what to appreciate what uh, context within which Christianity uh, emerged. In doing this, we, we say that the in terms of the socio-political world of the uh, what do you call uh, the best or the environment in which christianity began we say that christianity began as a small sect by a few jews in the roman empire and this is very important to note that when christianity began they were few jews they were jews number one and that is very significant to note. Many of the Christians, the Christians started as a Jewish sect, a group of 
Jews who then came together and uh, started doing all kinds of things. And so uh, they were a very minute group of people who just emerged. This shows that the social cultural reality of the Greek Roman world, which became the context of the writing of the New Testament. So Christianity began in the uh, what do you call Greek Roman setting. And in appearing in the Greek Roman setting, it is likely to have an influence. So the Greek Roman way of doing things affected Christian structures, affected the Christian movement, and interfe interfered with Christian growth and her practices in many ways. In this extent, we see that um, Christianity arose in the Roman Empire. And if you look at the map, you can see where the Roman Empire, if you look at all these dots, you see, all these, if you look at the Kesa, where it is moving, it showed you how wide the Roman Empire is. And I don't have uh, what you call authority over this picture. I picked it from online. And so it's not mine. I'm not claiming uh, authority over it. And so all of this, please, is what is called the Roman Empire, as you can see. And you see here, that is the Roman African region, where some significant Africans, uh, what do you call, who have contributed to Christian growth, were, uh, what do you call, hiding. And so then, that is the Roman territory. Now, in terms of a political structure, the Romans adopted a lot of, uh, what do you call, uh, rules, a lot of uh, uh, ways of dealing with things. The Roman system was hierarchical. The Roman, the Greek Roman system of political, uh, what do you call hegemony, was hierarchical and it was steep so that it was difficult for you to move from one level to the other. So the emperor is at the top and then he is surrounded by the senate. Okay, and then their Christian rank. These are people who had authority over certain state, and then the plebeians, and then you have the freed slaves. I mean, people who uh, were slaves, but uh, for one reason or the other, they've been able to move up the ladder. They are not slaves any longer, and so they they, they have a little status above the slaves. And as you can see, the pyramid, the slaves were more in the Roman setup whilst the freed slaves who usually served in the army and served as soldiers to show their allegiance were uh, a lit were also many but a little fewer than the slaves and then from there you have the plebeians who were the working class who did a lot of things then the christians were a ruling class and as for the senators they were the big men and out of the senators came an emperor. So you see that uh, it was a very structured system. And that is also very key for our future discussions. Now, in terms of the Jewish presence in the Roman Empire, this was how the Jews were settled. Uh, a little um, New Testament studies will tell you that the settlement pattern of the Jews in the Promised Land was according to tribes. So they settled in view of their tribes, whereas some were very close, others were far apart in the empire, so that it became difficult to interact with one another. Some were, so this is the Sea of Galilee, and this is the Dead Sea, and uh, this links them up so that... Uh, other activities could go on. So this was more like the settlement plan of the Jews. Now, in terms of dealing with the Jewish structures, it is very important to take note of certain institutions that um, the Jews held in high esteem, for which reason their acts and inactions were considered around these things. And we are taking first and foremost the temple. The temple was very important for the Jews, extremely important for the Jews, so that... Um, 
it was the place of worship for the Jews. That was where the Jews worship. And of course, like Christians today, <laughs> where the worship is important, you can go, <laughs> you can unite anywhere, but not around the temple. You see that thing? Uh -huh. So, uh, in the light of the Jews too, yes, the temple was very important for them. A lot of things went on. It was the only place where sacrifices were permitted. And this is very key. It's very key to note that the Jews had other places of worship, other places of meetings, but only the temple inhabited the altar where sacrifices were made. And that distinguished it in a lot of ways. Its history is by... The first temple was built by Solomon. This is important. There are three temples uh, in, uh, in Jewish history, three major temples, let me see, in Jewish history. The first one was built by Solomon. You recall that it was said that, um, <laughs> it was said that uh, David wanted to build a temple and God told him that because he has fought a lot of battles. Meanwhile, the battle that David fought, you go, you ask him to fight. Eh? <laughs> okay, David fought a lot of battles, and so he was told that his hands were stained with blood, and so he could not build the temple. And so we're told in scripture that okay, so as a result, David bought a lot of materials in preparation for the building of the temple by the next king, which then uh, apparently was Solomon. So Solomon built the first Jewish temple in 960 BC. BC means before Christ. Uh huh. Before Christ, he built it. And then the second one, as, okay, so what Solomon built was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 BC. Uh, the BC is counted backwards. It's not, it doesn't go forward. Uh -huh. So that from 960, we are not going to go to 1000. No, 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 no. We rather count backwards so that we'll come to the, what do you call, uh, AD. Right. So... That one was destroyed during the Babylonian, uh, what do you call, intake. So uh, Nebuchadnezzar took away the, the Jews and destroyed the temple for various reasons, for various reasons. Now, when that was done, the second temple was uh, built by Zerubbabel after the Babylonian exile. And it was largely supported by Cyrus, Cyrus, sorry, Cyrus, Cyrus. So Cyrus financed the building of the second temple in 516 or 515 BC. So you realize uh, the change or the movement from one point to the other. You should be able to tell how much time the first <coughs> temple stood <coughs> before a destruction. You should be able to tell how much time it took for the rebuilding of the first temple that is the second temple when was it i mean all these calculations you can look from the date and then you are off to go right so the second temple was built by zerubbabel that is important to know and then it was also destroyed under the roman invasion by under emperor pompey so the second temple was also destroyed in 63 bc and then uh, the third temple was constructed by herod the great in 20 a.d herod the great herod the great aha uh -huh. so you see that it is very important now the point you need to note in this is that in rebuilding the temple uh, there has been three phases the first one built by solomon pulled down by uh, Nebuchadnezzar, then Zerubbabel builds the second one with support from Cyrus, and then the third one is by Herod the Great. This is one of the reasons why Herod is important to the Jews. Herod is important to Christian development and cannot be uh, overemphasized on all of these. Now, again, even the third temple was destroyed in 70 AD, uh, uh, in the Jewish war, Jewish war, in the Jewish antiquity, that was also pulled down. So now you see the history of the temple as uh, we have had over history. Now, it is important to note the structure of the temple. The temple is what you can see, and it had a lot of features. It has a lot of features. If you look at this place, this is the holy place. It was the place where uh, sacrifices are made once a year. And then you will have the Holy of Holies in uh, somewhere here. Uh, if you can see where the Kesa is, 
and then you have so you can see the altar the altar is here and all of that we'll go through the structure and uh, you see what uh, each structure had and this is very important i usually make good use of it if you know what i mean <laughs> so this is the altar and then you see that this is the court of men of israel so only the men will be seated here and then behind them will be the court of uh, women of israel the court of women of israel before then we will have the court of priests somewhere here okay around the altar it was after them that you will have the court of men of israel and then later you will have the court of women of israel and then you have the court of the gentiles so the gentiles those who are not jews would then be here the court of the gentiles will be here and then the market will also be here the court of the gentiles also is here where those who are not jews could uh that's the farthest they can come. If you are not a Jew, you can cross this boundary and come and see what is happening. But the women are going to. So this is the structure. The, the, the temple had its own features. It had the level to which you are allowed to go in and the level to which you are not allowed to go in. So let's look at the plan. So it had the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies has the Ark of the Covenant. That is where the Ark of the Covenant of God was held. And over there, the priest goes there once a year. The priest goes there once a year to offer sacrifice. And if you are told, if the priest is going, he goes with certain things on his ankle and his arm, that bells, pomegranates that will be ringing, just so that if he falls down, he cannot, the people cannot go in there and pick him. And so a rope is tied around his waist so that it will be used to pull him out. Uh -huh. So that is uh, for the Holy of Holies. It is a very special, it's a very spirited place and that you just don't go there. Yes. So uh, the Holy of Holies, and we're saying that the priest goes there once a year. It has the mercy seat to offer sacrifices and to seek for atonement for the people of Israel. Then beyond there, we will have the holy place. So the holy of holies is separated from the holy place with a curtain. It was that curtain that it was said that when Jesus died, where it got divided into two. Uh -huh. That is the curtain. And so the holy place will then come in and then will take over the holy of holies. And the holy place has the golden altar of incense a table for the consecrated bread and incense. So the holy place, if you recall, those of you who have been going to church, Mumbu or Harmony are sorry, and you're fine. It's okay. <laughs> those of you who've been going to church, you are told that David at a point in time ventured into the temple and took the holy bread. So that is where the holy of the holy place, that is where that was kept. And uh, these other things are also there. Then from the holy place, you have the court of priests. This is where the altar is for sacrifice and the priest sits there as well. And then you have the court of men of Israel. So this is where only Jewish men can go. If you're a woman, you can't uh, what you call, go through that path. Then we have uh, the court of women. That part is for the women of Israel. Only women could go there also uh, because it's reserved for them. And then you will have the court of Gentiles. So pagans, those who are not Jews, could also come up as far as to this place only. And it's for foreigners, certainly. And then there is the porch. That is the surrounding of the temple. So typically when uh, they were doing the seals, that was at the porch the one that jesus got angry <laughs> and lashed them uh -huh. that was uh, in the porch and that was where uh, whatever happened uh, went on and uh, it was in a form of a, the letter t it, it, it's in the form of the letter t to show that uh, they could do some sales and other stuff now the temple uh what do you call was managed by the high priest the high priest was the one who was in charge of the activities and the things that go on in the temple and beyond that he also had the chief priest as his assistant and then there are other priests 
Okay, so the high priest is on top, and then you have the chief priest, and then the other priest will come in. Then after you will have the Levites. You will have the Levites. These are lay ministers who assisted in uh, the priests in the service. So you recall that uh, typically those of you who are Catholics, you have the mass servants. Uh -huh. They are more like the Levites. Uh -huh. So they assisted in management and in running the temple. The temple plays significant roles in the New Testament. In the New Testament, Jesus referred to it as the house of God, and he calls it uh, my father's house. So the temple is very important to the Jews and Christian worship and service. In essence, the disciples, if you recall, admired the beauty of the temple. When they saw it and Jesus told them that, oh, irrespective of its beauty, he's going to pull it down. <laughs> so a contractor went to me. He was going to pull it down. Uh-huh. And uh, whatever happened, Jesus prophesied the destruction of the temple. And that is also very key. Now, beyond the temple is also another very significant institution of the Jews. So just as we are saying, closer to the temple is the synagogue. Now, the synagogue is different from the temple in various ways. And in this lecture, you tend to see how different. Now, if you look at the two pictures, this is the oldest synagogue. And then this is the inside, the internal of it. So as you can see, in the temple, you have the Holy of Holies. But here, you don't have a Holy of Holies. You don't have the altar because sacrifices are not made here. Now, when you talk about the synagogue, it can't from a Greek word, which means together, to bring together, to gather an assembly place, a place of meeting. It is a place where people come together to have certain interactions, to meet certain needs for themselves. It was developed as a result of the deportation in the diaspora. So the point we are making is that when the uh, Jews were taken to Babylon and were taken to other places and they wanted the opportunity to, as it were, uh, to worship. They needed the temple. And in so long as they cannot have the temple, they developed a structure. They developed something because, you see, when it comes to the Jews, they must worship in the temple. But once they can't worship over there, they try to locate a place. They try to develop a structure to help them meet that, uh, if you like, need. And that was why they brought up the concept of the synagogue. And so the, the synagogue is largely a place of meeting for the Jews so that they take decisions. It was developed as a result of the deportation. Those who were unable to assess the temple gathered for prayer and the study of the scriptures. And so that was how come it began. It was where the Jews worshipped, where they were far away from Jerusalem. So anytime the Jews are far away from Jerusalem, that's what we're talking about, the diaspora. So that when the Jews were scattered as a result of war and other, uh, what do you call, uh, destabilizing conditions, then they met in the synagogue for their religious activities. The synagogue was a non-cultic institution. That is to say, it was not a place where sacrifices are made. So if in an exam or in a test, I ask what is a non-cultic institution, it only means that, uh, what do you call, uh, sacrifices are not made there. So if I ask for name one non-cultic institution, you quickly say synagogue, and then you are good to go. <laughs> you see, so th and that is how your questions, uh, I said them all. Me, I said my questions in class. And so when I'm telling you these, then you are taking note of them. I have told you that the synagogue is a non-cultic institution, unlike the temple. So if I tell you, give one example of a cultic institution, then you know that it is the temple, a non-cultic institution. Then you know that it is the synagogue. Pronto. <laughs> so easy and simple. Oh, yes. That's how it goes. So that is the temple. Now, the synagogue 
um, Jesus and the disciples visited the synagogue regularly. It was the uses of the synagogue was that it is a place of worship. It was a place for catechetical instruction, catechetical instruction. Uh, you know, uh, those of you who are Presbyterian, <clears throat> you go for catechism. Uh -huh. That is education. So catechetical means education, educational instruction, or largely religious instruction. And that was done in the synagogue. So educational, catechetical instruction, Roman, the Catholics also uh, uh, go for catechism and all of that. Uh -huh. So it was also a place of, uh, it, it, it acted like a school. It acted like a school where teaching and learning took place uh, in the secular thing. So it was a place for religious instruction and secular instruction. And then it was also, it also plays a role as a social function. When there is supposed to be naming and other social gatherings, the Jews did that in the synagogue. Uh -huh. And it also acts as a place for judicial, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, settlements. So that when there, were, there are issues of judicial nature that needed to be settled on, the synagogue was used as a place where uh, the high priest will sit and adjudicate those issues. So it was very important place for the Jews. Another very important institution of the Jews is the Sahindrin. Is the Sahindrin. The Sahindrin plays a very important role in the life of the Jews. And the Sahindrin, if this is how they sat when they, they, they met, it was made up of about 72 people. And when they meet, they sit like this so that you can see each other's face and you can see each other uh, 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 in terms of the interactions that will be held. Now, the Sahindrin originally means a council or advices to the high priest. So they are a council who meet and then take decisions. And then uh, it is from the Greek word syndrome, which means council, session, or sitting together. So if in a test or an exam you are asked what does the Greek word syndrome mean, then you say council or sitting together or something and you'll be good to go. Traditionally, it is traced from the 70 elders set up by Moses in Numbers chapter 11, verse 12 to 25. Um, I know uh, when I cite Bible, many of you could have been asked. After praise and adoration, they don't listen to sermon. So they go to church too, and there are some of you too, your head is like something. All that you need is uh, the the drums. So you are instrumental. You go to play. You don't listen to scripture. So you don't listen to sermon. So they make a people about say, "Hey, you are doing more." Some too. Some of the ladies too. You go to church so that you show yourselves. You got a new dress. You got a new necklace. Your boyfriend has bought a new shoe for you. Eh? No, I share the question. Sorry. Hey, Ed, you. <laughs> I pity your pastors. <laughs> anyway, in scripture. We are told that uh, when Moses was leading the people of Israel, at a point in time, he, he was getting tired. He was getting tired. He sat for a long time adjudicating cases. People were coming to him to deal with all manner of issues, blah, 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 blah. So his father-in-law advised him that he should bring up people who would deal with these matters, who would settle these cases for him so that he can have rest for himself. So... Um, Moses then set up 70 people who adjudicated cases uh -huh, and helped him to manage the people so that uh, his burden will be released. Uh -huh. And that is what is known today or is translated as the setting up of the Sahindrin. Okay, so that is where it traces it through. It included the high priest who is the head and then also you have the other priests around him to help to settle issues. And then you have the Sadducees. We'll talk about the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Sadducees were part of the Sanhedrin and they were the learned elite. And then the Pharisees were actually the religious elites. And then you have the scribes. They wrote uh, whatever, they were more like secretaries and they were indeed the lawyers. And so anytime in most cases we see the scribes they are referred to as the lawyers but they did 
all the writings and the screws. They had very good handwriting. They were not like some of you. Motra said, yeah, I could call it here. <laughs> anyway, like myself, you see you. But uh, they had very good handwriting. So they dealt, the scribes dealt with the, the screws and uh, handled it. The Sahindrin, the rules that the Sahindrin had included executive authority to establish peace or war. Whenever the people of Israel or the Jews wanted to go for war, the decision would have to come from the Sahindrin to see whether they should go or they should not go. If something is supposed to happen, the Sahindrin did that. They made laws for the Jews. They were the lawmakers. And so more like parliament, they start to make laws for the Jews in diverse ways to take decisions and to act accordingly. And then they had judicial power. Now, what, this is very important to note that when it comes to the Sahindrin, they had judicial power. They can sentence anybody and they can give certain rulings about uh, whatever uh, may be happening to a person. What is troubling is that, so the Sahindrin had a lot of power. They had judicial power. They can sentence a person to whatever. but the, And they can even sentence a person to death. But the death sentence penalty that they had was only for stoning. So like the case of Stephen, the Sahindrin passed the judgment to be stoned to death. What they did not have was the power to sentence anybody to death by crucifixion. Crucifixion. So in the trial of Jesus, you see that the Sahindrin wanted Jesus to die by crucifixion because they felt that when you die by stoning, it is, it is not humiliating that much, okay? But that if you have to be humiliated well enough, then you must be crucified. And because they wanted that, they needed the... Uh, the Romans who were in authority to give that because they could not give that. So the Sahindrin had power to give uh, judgment, including the death penalty. But their authority to give the death penalty was or is only to die by stoning, but not by crucifixion. So that is the distinction when it comes to the powers of the Sahindrin. You need to get that distinction right, that they could sentence a person to death but by stoning and not by crucifixion. Because to be sentenced to death by crucifixion, the Romans were the only persons who had that authority so to do. And so uh, that was uh, what went on with the uh, Sahindrin. They had judicial power to death by stoning and not by crucifixion. And if they gave judgment, it was also subjected to the Roman influence because the Romans can overturn it. That was why they paid Judas Iscariot to betray Jesus. And then they tried Jesus and the disciples. So we see that the Sahindrins were a very important institution. It was a combination of various people who came together to pass judgment and to rule the Jews. It was an important institution in the Jewish uh, uh, setup, which cannot just be uh, brushed away or set aside. It was a very important one. Now let's talk about my people. Hey! <laughs> the fallacies, fallacies. Uh, somebody may be on the so fallacies. The Pharisees were a very important uh, group of people in the Roman uh, setup, and particularly the Jewish setup. The they had some authority and if you look at the addressing and the way they did their things they were very uh, 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 interesting in terms of the pharisees they are a sect believed to have emerged during the hesmanian uh, war um we, uh, if we want to go into the hesmanian or the maccabean war that, that would take a lot but uh, it was to say that the Hasmanian war came to being when uh, some Jews saw that by the Roman influences, it was influencing them culturally. It was influencing the Hebrew way, the Greek way of life. And so some, uh, what do you call it? 
Jews rose up against the Roman hegemony to say that no, 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 no. The Romans cannot rule over the Jews uh, because if they, the Romans come, they come in with the way they did their things. And the Romans were polygamous while the Jews were monogamous. The Romans were polygamous while the Jews were monogamous. Hey. Sorry. <laughs> reverse, 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 reverse. The Romans were polytheistic whilst the, uh, the Jews were monotheistic. The Romans were polytheistic. They worshipped many gods, polytheistic, whilst the Jews were monotheistic. So the to the uh, Romans, to be a Roman, you must worship a lot of gods from all levels. From all levels. And we'll get into it when uh, we, we get into the Roman setup and you'll understand uh, why and how. They worshipped a lot of gods. But the Jews worshipped only God, Yahweh. And so when the Romans uh, became if like the colonial masters of the Jews, they brought in the worship of their other gods, which some of the... Jews felt that, no, 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 we can't allow that to go. The infiltration was getting too much. And so they rose against the Romans in a battle. And in that battle, a lot of things went on. That is why we have the Maccabean revolt, the Maccabean revolt from the family of the Maccabees. And they fought the Romans in so many ways, and a lot of things happened. And so the Pharisees were a small group of people who were as a result of that war. From the Hebrew Pesha, it means separated ones or to distinguish. So the Pharisees saw themselves as distinguished people and they were separate from the other uh, Romans or from the other uh, Roman, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, authorities, so to say. In essence, by their superior teaching on holiness, they were separated people because they believed in holiness see the pharisees are like my friends uh the su people in secondary school <laughs> hey santimonos piosity hey when they are walking they, it's as if they don't want to step on uh, on, on even ants hey as you for what you can't beat them very holy they don't want to uh, very very holy uh, you see the Pharisees, they are very, very holy. They are like when <laughs> Christians are going for communion, they will do their thing. Mm, as if. <laughs> hey, the Pharisees, they are far away that they can't see. <laughs> so you see, the Pharisees saw themselves as separated people. They saw themselves as holy. And as a result, uh, they, they were not, uh, what do you call uh, they were not many. They were not many. They were just a few group of people. And a, a few features that distinguished them was that they were strict observers of the Torah. They observed the Torah, the word of God. For them, it was infinite and it was authoritative in everything that they did. So to the Pharisees, the Torah was everything for them and they observed it strictly. They also followed the tradition of the elders, like fasting, the Sabbath, tithing, ritual cleansing. When a Pharisee goes out to the market, by the time he comes back, he must go and wash himself because Praventure, when he went to the market, he greeted somebody who was unclean. And yet, he, 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 maybe when he went out, he stepped on something that he was not supposed to step on. And so they fasted very well twice a week. And then the Sabbath day, they kept it. Hey, on the Sabbath day, they, they do not work. They don't do anything. Hey, Pharisees. Yeah, Pharisees. And they were strict observers of Titan. Look at some of you. <laughs> the Pharisees will pay tight accurately without any blemish. And they held on strictly to these things. 
and they wore large philatrists, large philatrists. I'll show you a picture of a philatrist. The philatrist was more like something they put on their forehead. And the whole idea of that is to show that they are holy, so that they are, they are special people. So when you see them, you can see them. And uh, they were part of the Sahindran, which we have mentioned already. They were lay movement group. They were not largely priests, Omanya Sofo per se, but they were very, very versed in the Torah, in the scriptures. They studied it very well and they lived by it. Some of their doctrines was that they had a strong belief in the books of Moses. So the five books of Moses was uh, the Atoban. They don't play with the books of Moses at all. That is the Pharisees. And they had a strong expectation of the Messiah that the, the Messiah was going to save them. You know, we have talked about their beginning as a result of the Maccabean revolt and the fact that they did not like the Roman rule. As a result of which, they expected the Messiah who was coming to save them from the oppression of the Romans. The Messiah was coming to save them from the oppression of the Messiah, of the Romans. And so they put a lot of emphasis on the expectation of the Messiah. And so in those of you who go to church, uh, you, 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 you sometimes have the question, a lot of times Jesus has been asked, is he the Messiah, is he waiting? And sometimes they get confused. Yeah, They believed in divine providence according to man's will. They believe in God interfering in the affairs of men, that God will interfere and uh, will help you so that even if you have learned, not learned, you will sit to the exam and you will pass. So you are saying amen. How can you not learn and you want to pass? What about you are <laughs> Right. So uh, they believed in God interfering in the uh, act of men. So certainly they believed in miracles. This is one of the major distinctions between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Where the Pharisees believed in miracles because God intervened in the affairs of men. The Sadducees did not believe in miracles at all because everything is principle. They also believed in spirits and uh, angels, demons, and all of those things. They believed that those things exist, which the Sadducees do not believe in. They believed in judgment and resurrection. They believed that God is going to come to judge his people and all kinds of things, which the Sadducees do not believe in. They don't believe in angels. They don't believe in spirits. They don't believe in judgment. <laughs> Yeah, that is just about it. In the New Testament, we see the Pharisees in so many ways. We see them oppose uh, Jesus regularly. In so many ways, we find them opposing Jesus. And Jesus actually calls them snake. He calls them brood of vipers. Hey, hypocrites. Heartless, legalistic persons. Hey, you should say, that no one know you. Snake under glass, snake under glass, and the Pharisees, they are snake under glass, and they are hypocrites, <laughs> heartless, they piled a lot of things for people to carry, but they themselves never get to carry uh, any, and they were very legalistic in the way they did their things. A famous quote of the Pharisees. Uh, a famous Pharisee is Nicodemus. You recall that uh, you are told that uh, a man came to Jesus at night. He came to Jesus at night. And that was Nicodemus and asked that he be born again and sought that if he could be uh, born. And again, uh, we are also told that Paul was a Pharisee who was handled uh, 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 <laughs> interestingly by the way he did his things. Now, we come to the Sadducees. I promised you I was uh, going to show you a picture of the, uh, what do you call, uh, what do you call, um, the philatrist. The philatrist was this thing that, uh -huh, you can see it from here. So if you look at this, this is what is called the philatrist. You see, Adi Abon Mumasi. And the Pharisees often kept large ones, very huge ones, to show that uh, they are holy ones. Uh, they are not sinful like you. <laughs> so they kept that. So that is the Pharisees and the picture of the things that they did. Now, from the Pharisees, we come to the Sadducees. 
the Sadducees, those who are sad that they cannot see. <laughs> so that is the Sadducees. Yeah, and you see the way they are seated. So that is the picture of the Sadducees. Now, the thing is that the Sadducees um, was also a sect by the Maccabean revolt. They are also as a result of the Maccabean revolt. So both the Pharisees and the Sadducees are from the same context, the Maccabean revolt. Whereas the Pharisees did not like Roman rule, the Sadducees like Roman rule. And the Sadducees are said to be from the descendants of the Zadok the priest. Zadok the priest. Those of you who go to church, you may know. Membership was limited to the upper class from religious and political background. So you must be an upper class. You must have a lot of wealth in order to be part of the Sadducees. And they were largely um, religious, although they were religious, they were very political. They were, so to say, they were in bed with the Romans. Jews were in bed with the Romans. And their features included the fact that they were aristocratic members, those, those who were learned and very well educated in the way they did their thing. Some of them were magistrates even under the Roman rule. Okay, And so you, it tells you that their standing was very high. In him and they supported the Roman rule, which I've said they were landowners and lived luxuriously. They had luxurious homes and <laughs> sometimes sometimes you can ask yourself that ah, in this world Charlie, what kind of life is this? Even as students, <laughs> students be out to be someone say, Hey, I grow and they are so many. <laughs> you see, so whereas the Pharisees were very religious and did not mind a lot about money and wealth, the Sadducees were very wealthy. They were very, very wealthy. Although they were Jews, they even supported the Roman rule because, of course, they got their entitlement from the Roman rule. <coughs> Some of them were judges magistrate some of them were of their christian order and all of that so uh, that was the difference and uh, they had membership on the sahindran so sometimes you can imagine how the sahindran would be two opposing people the pharisees and the sadducees made membership on the sahindran in terms of their doctrines we say that the sadducees did not accept the torah in form they were Jews, so they accepted the Torah, but not in full. Certain parts of the Torah they didn't subscribe to. They felt that those parts uh, did not <laughs> were not right because he spoke against their wealth, and <laughs> uh, they did not believe in some of the tradition of the elders as well. They rejected the tradition of the elders, just as uh, uh, I was just saying. They rejected them. They didn't accept. So ritual cleansing, washing of hands, and all of those things, mm, they didn't care that much. And then they did not have an, an expectation of the Messiah. Now, they own the businesses. Can you imagine? Indeed. Let me ask a question. Let me ask a question. Indeed, as I come in this train to you, super bad. And I don't go to is he waiting for Christ coming? Hey, you're not getting business. Oh, life is good. Can you imagine? Uh, uh, some uh, a friend of mine got married, and I told him that oh, he was a preacher. So I told him, uh, Jesus is coming. Then he was saying, Hey, but what can I am and how are they? And you are now going to come. I say no, 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 no. On the on you're ready. <laughs> so these uh, Sadducees had a lot of money, and uh, they owned a lot of enterprises. They owned a lot of shops. They owned a lot of the businesses, and so they would not have an expectation. Ah, whether I'll be yes, can or no, be some will say, "Nyame ombra na unisika na odwin say." now <laughs> right so then they did not have an expectation of the messiah because to them the messiah uh -huh, it's not yet time for the messiah to come <laughs> and uh, further to this they did not accept the belief in uh, angels or spirits and uh, neither did, did they have any expectation of uh, the resurrection of the dead so say resurrection of the dead they don't accept it they don't believe it and they don't take it at all again 
the Sadducees did not believe in divine providence, reward and punishment and death. No, 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 no. To them, uh, yes, there is the divine and uh, everything could go on. But uh, in their circumstance, they don't uh, believe that <laughs> they, there will be a miracle. Mm, miracle, so saying. But I come to an Azul Yamila Obon Pai and American will fire, but say when you over the old So there's nothing like divine uh, intervention, divine rewards and punishment. They don't take uh, those things at all. For the Sahindrin, you see, they, they were more scholastic and they were more thoughtful in the things that they did and would not give room for anything that would interfere with them. So the Sahindrin were so important in the things that they did. In the New Testament, you come to note that the uh, John the Baptist call, also called them snakes. <laughs> Yeah, and they opposed the Pharisees in so many ways as well in the things that they did. Again, uh, they teamed up with the Pharisees on some occasions to ask Jesus for a miracle. And I've already told you that they did not believe in miracles. And so it was more like mocking Jesus to uh, <laughs> attempt to say that uh, he's giving them a miracle. Uh -huh. So that was it. And then they also questioned Jesus on marriage in heaven. You know, uh, they they, uh, they came to Jesus with a parable that a man married, he couldn't give birth uh, uh, with a wife. And so when he died, his brothers married the woman consecutively and they all couldn't give birth. And they asked the question that, uh -huh, so if we, uh, <clears throat> we go to heaven, whose wife will that woman then be? And the whole idea was to ridicule the, the issue of resurrection, uh -huh, resurrection, which they do not believe in. They don't even believe in the final day. Why would they <laughs> believe in judgment? <laughs> so uh, then that was why. And Jesus rather told them that there is no marriage in heaven. So in essence, we see them playing significant roles. Now, another a final group that uh, we are talking about uh, are the Zillions. The Zillions. These were largely a militant group. So if you look at uh, the way this guy is having, they are Jews and they are religious people, but they are militants. They, 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 they are fighting. Uh -huh. They fight to establish God's rule and the kingdom of God. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so you can see the way they fight for them in dealing with the things of God, you must fight to establish the rule of God. So the zeal of this is a group that arose as a resistance to the Greek uh, domination of the Jews under uh, King uh, Antiochus uh, the fourth. And when they rose, they are believed to have started by Justus uh, Jacobus. They are believed to have been started by uh, Judas Maccabees so that they will establish the... Uh, the Zealots uh, are perceived to have been an activity uh, which was started by Judas Maccabees of Galilee who was against the Roman census. You know, uh, the Romans, when they were ruling the, uh, the Jews, took the opportunity to always be counting, <laughs> counting, counting, counting. So they counted a lot. And uh, typically, the Jews believe that uh, God was against counting. When you counted the people, you were trying to show your might and to show your authority. The, the title Ken for them was a reserve of God alone. And so if you called yourself a king, it meant that you want to be God and they cannot stand it. They have to fight you to, I mean, eliminate that name from that title, so to say. They are responsible for the Jewish war, which eventually led to the destruction of the temple in 70 uh, AD. That is the third temple. They, they, because of their resistance to the Romans, they were always fighting the Romans and they did a lot of things. Their main feature, 
features included their opposing Roman rule using military means. And you saw the way they addressed, you saw the way they did their things. And that was to emphasize that they didn't like Roman rule. They were nationalistic and fanatical in their outlook. When we say somebody is nationalistic, they, it's like they loved their country so much. Mm -hmm. They loved their country just the way you love Ghana. <laughs> between Ghana and Kosovo, Kosovo. They were very nationalistic. They loved the Jewish nation because of the expectation of the Messiah. They, they, they stood for anything that is God and they would not downplay it. They had a strong expectation of the Messiah who would lead them in a battle. So to the Zealots, the Messiah was going to come. And when the Messiah comes, the Messiah will lead them in battle against the Romans. And so they did not look down on that expectation. It was a high expectation they had that the <clears throat> savior of the world was going to be with them. And when he comes, he is going to establish a rule on earth and they are, they are going to fight. That is why they trained a lot and they battled. Their leaders were seen as uh, the Messiah. And so... Uh, they put a lot of emphasis on that and they strongly oppose the payment of taxes as idolatry. So for them, you don't have to pay taxes because of course they didn't support the Roman rule. So why would they want to give their monies to the Romans? No. So, and they saw payment of tax as idolatry so that when you pay taxes, you pay taxes to those who are above you, those who you worship. Uh -huh. And so to pay taxes to the Romans, then it meant that you are giving off your authority and you are, uh, what do you call, giving room to other things that should not be. In the New Testament, the one of the disciples of Jesus was a zealot, Simon the zealot. Uh -huh. Again, uh, it's believed that Judas Iscariot and Barnabas were uh, of the Good Friday. Barnabas, the one who was released in place of Jesus. I uh, uh, could have told you something. <laughs> the one who was released in place of Jesus is believed to have been a zealot. And Judas Iscariot himself is believed to have been a zealot. Jesus did not support the, the ideologies of the zealots especially in the use of violence. Jesus did not support the application of violence in meeting the needs of the people. So guys, uh, I'm most grateful for your participation today. Uh, as you well know, we are supposed to uh, uh, take these lectures seriously. And I'm telling you, next week, we'll meet in person and we'll do a pop-up quiz. So those of you who want to come to class, fine. If you don't come to class, fine. And make sure you don't come late. You don't know when I'll take the quiz. Mm. And I, I, okay, it's a quiz. It's a pop-up quiz. That is why it's called pop-up. <laughs> no announcement. But this one, I've even made an announcement. But guys, uh, thank you very much for being part of the course. Um, get the necessary material. All these things I'm talking about is in the book. Let me show it to you. It's in the book. Uh, which chapter is that? Let me see. Let me have that off head. I think it's one of the yes, chapter two, chapter two of the book, the social and political world of Jesus. Last week, what we did was in chapter one. So you just have to read them, you get them, and then and it's not that the language is down to earth, and it's not that many you can uh, do better. Those of you who have not gotten it, please. Pass by the department and then get it. A cool 70 cities. Uh, last year I told you we sold it for 100, but uh, because we had a new printer, uh, that is why it has come down. So uh, make sure you get a copy for yourself. And um, I'm sure by next week we'll be starting tutorials. Know that your class participation is important, your tutorial participation is also important, and then uh, the necessary tests that would happen. Where the, I have told you again that. The IA will be an open book from the Introduction to Christianity textbook by the department and the, the more reason you should get it. So I'm happy that some of you have already started paying for the trip to Cape Coast as well. Please, uh, let's pay by the end of the month so that we can uh, solidify a lot of arrangement. Beyond the month, we will not accept any further registrations. I mean, 
um, we need to uh, keep going and so please make sure you do it if you are you want us to give you a fort you pay 250 if you don't want fort you pay 200 so that uh, things gets easier so guys um thank you so very much and uh, i'll see you next week in class take good care of yourself watch out don't follow the crowd i mean know where you are know where you are coming from so that you don't mess up and please take your books seriously i understand many of you are not taking your books you are more interested in the frimsy uh lives here sister by the time i went back to you know so please start learning now don't say that i'm waiting uh after i is so that hmm, start learning these things uh, can be very confusing and so uh, take up and don't forget that i'm your course rep and so if you have any challenges on wednesdays from uh, morning till 12 i'm in the office to receive you and have a discussion with you on whatever that will help okay so thank you so very much take good care of yourself and bye don't forget to subscribe to my channel subscribe uh-huh i'm on fire